From the Heliconian Muses, let us begin to sing, who hold the great and holy mount of Helicon, and dance on soft feet about the deep blue spring and the altar of the almighty son of Kronos. And, when they have washed their tender bodies in Permessus, or in the horse's spring, or Olmius, make their fair lovely dances upon highest Helicon, and move with vigorous feet. Thence they arise and go abroad by night, veiled in thick mist, and utter their song with lovely voice, praising Zeus the Aegis-bearer and queenly Hera of Argos, who walks on golden sandals, and the daughter of Zeus the Aegis-holder, bright-eyed Athena, and Phoebus Apollo and Artemis who delights in arrows, and Poseidon the earth-shaker who shakes the earth, and reverend Themis, and quick-glancing Aphrodite, and Hebe with the crown of gold, and fair Dion, Leto, Iapetus, and Cronos the crafty counsellor. Eos and great Helios and bright Selene, Earth too and great Oceanus and dark night and the holy race of all the other deathless ones that are forever. Come thou, let us begin with the muses who gladden the great spirit of their father, Zeus in Olympus with their songs, telling of things that are and that shall be and that were aforetime with consenting voice. Unwearying flows the sweet sound from their lips, and the house of their father Zeus the loud thunderer is glad at the lily-like voice of the goddesses as it spread abroad, and the peaks of snowy Olympus resound, and the homes of the immortals. And they, uttering their immortal voice, celebrate in song first of all the reverend race of the gods from the beginning, those whom earth and wide heaven begot, and the god sprung of these giver of things. Then next the goddesses sing of Zeus, the father of gods and men. As they begin and end their strain, how much he is the most excellent among the gods and supreme in power. And again they chant the race of men and strong giants, and gladden the heart of Zeus within Olympus the Olympian Muses, daughters of Zeus, the Aegis Holder. Them in Pyrea did Mnemosyne, who reigns over the hills of Eleuther, bear of union with the father, the son of Kronos, a forgetting of ills and a rest from sorrow. For nine nights did wise Zeus lie with her, entering her holy bed remote from the immortals, and when a year was past and the seasons came round as the months waned and many days were accomplished, she bare nine daughters, all of one mind, whose hearts are set upon song and their spirit free from care, a little way from the topmost peak of snowy Olympus. There are their bright dancing places and beautiful homes, and beside them the graces and Himeris live in delight, and they, uttering through their lips a lovely voice, sing the laws of all and the goodly ways of the immortals, uttering their lovely voice. Then went they to Olympus, delighting in their sweet voice with heavenly song, and the dark earth resounded about them as they chanted, and a lovely sound rose up beneath their feet as they went to their father. And he was reigning in heaven, himself holding the lightning and glowing thunderbolt, when he had overcome by might his father Kronos, and he distributed fairly to the immortals their portions and declared their privileges. These things, then, the muses sang who dwell on Olympus, nine daughters begotten by great Zeus, Cleo and Euterpe, Thalia, Melpomene, and Terpsichor, and Irato, and Polyhymnia, and Urania, and Calliope, who is the chiefest of them all, 
for she attends the worshipful princes, whomsoever of heaven nourished princes the daughters of great Zeus honor, and behold him at his birth. They pour sweet dew upon his tongue, and from his lips flow gracious words. All the people look towards him while he settles causes with true judgments, and he, speaking surely, would soon make wise and even a great quarrel, for therefore are their princes wise in heart, because when the people are being misguided in their assembly, they set right the matter again with ease, persuading them with gentle words. And when he passes through a gathering, they greet him as a god with gentle reverence, and he is conspicuous among the assembled. Such is the holy gift of the muses to men, for it is through the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there are singers and harpers upon the earth. But princes are of Zeus, and happy is he whom the muses love. Sweet flows speech from his mouth, for though a man have sorrow and grief in his newly troubled soul, and live in dread because his heart is distressed, yet... When a singer, the servant of the muses, chants the glorious deeds of men of old and the blessed gods who inhabit Olympus, at once he forgets his heaviness and remembers not his sorrows at all, but the gifts of the goddesses soon turn him away from these. Oh, hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am here with the very special official 100th episode of this podcast. Now, yes, there are well over 100 episodes to binge. Actually, we're nearing 200. But when it comes to the somewhat arbitrary numbering system I've stuck myself with, this is episode 100. You'll probably have noticed I've done away with the mini-myths. Now that I've got the time to prepare episodes, we're going with all standard length ones now. Because of that arbitrary 100, though, I wanted to do something special. And what is more special than Mount Parnassus, the mythological home of the Muses and the archaeological home of the Oracle? What an important mountain it was and is. What I recited at the top of this episode was sections of Hesiod's Theogony, translated by Hugh Evelyn White. A little call to those precious and brilliant muses, those nine women who've given us all the world's arts and sciences. Now, you might be thinking right off the top, Liv, the passages you just read us described Mount Helicon, not Mount Parnassus. You'd be correct. Mount Helicon is also sacred to the Muses, both mountains are, and they're really quite close to each other in Boeotia. The Muses are said to have lived on Mount Helicon, Mount Parnassus, and in Pyrea. But Mount Parnassus is where the Oracle is, so we're just going to push Helicon from our minds just for the moment. Oh, the Oracle. So, so long ago, I teased you all with a series of episodes on the Oracle that never came through. Honestly, the things I believed I could do while also working full-time was a bit of a joke. But now, this is my job, and so there's more Oracle to come. More deep-diving episodes, more deeply researched, more fun. Where would we be without the muses? There'd be no books, music, movies. There'd be no theater, literature, art, science. We, as a people, would be lost. There certainly wouldn't be the muses singing their way through Disney's Hercules, and that in itself would be a true travesty. The muses were vital to the ancient Greek world, which valued art, science, poetry, and music above most other things. And they're equally vital to us now. These nine women give everyone their inspiration, their ideas. They make sure we're all living our best and most art-filled lives. And the oracle? Where would Greek mythology, Greek history even, be without the oracle of Delphi? That Pythia making all the rules, the woman who held the cards for the ancient and mythological peoples of the whole region. Well, there would be a lot fewer mishaps, a lot fewer cases of mistaken identity and death and destruction. But what fun would that be? This 
This is episode 100. Sing, muses, of yourselves, of Apollo, eagles, dragons, and the oracle of Delphi. The hike up Mount Parnassus is steep, but so many have hiked it before. The path is well trodden. The most famous figures of history and myth have walked the same path in search of their fortunes, good or bad. A sea of varied shades of green stretch on either side of it, with the orange of the limestone mountain visible ahead, its cleft hovering over the oracle's complex. Below and beyond, the green and blue of the Gulf of Corinth and even the Peloponnesian Peninsula are visible in the distance. The site is as beautiful as it is vital to the world it served. The sparkling marble of the city-state storehouses mark the winding path up to the even more stunning facade of the Temple of Apollo, where, inside, she waited to foretell the fates of others. The Pythia spoke the word of Apollo, but it was she who ultimately held all the cards, she who would determine the fate of the most important rulers and statesmen of the ancient world, She could decide the outcome of a war, the decision of how to handle a crisis, whether one deserved life or death. Though the men of ancient Greece would have never said it aloud, in the end, they were all beholden to that one woman, the Pythia. The complex of Delphi and its oracle is built into the side of Mount Parnassus, overlooking the Gulf of Corinth and the fields of green below. Parnassus is a mostly limestone mountain, it has this kind of orange color beyond where the trees grow, and it hovers over the oracle complex built into its side. That region in Greece sits on a fault line, and it was prone to earthquakes, which is likely why the site was built there, why it felt so special and connected to the divinities. It shook. Often. Of course, that also leads to theories of how and why the oracle did what she did, how she saw the future and prophesied. Were there noxious fumes emanating from the earth due to this fault line? We don't know for sure, because to carry her mystery further through history, the complex of Delphi was covered over by time and, importantly, earthquakes and resulting rock slides. It wasn't until the 19th century that they began to slowly unearth the ancient complex of Delphi, and only because yet another earthquake displaced a modern town that existed on top of the ruins. But how did it become the site of the most famous oracle? It's said that Zeus wanted to find the center of the universe, the navel of the world, they called it. So he sent two eagles flying in opposite directions— Where they finally met up would be the center of the world, its navel. Eventually, the eagles indicated that that spot on the side of Mount Parnassus was the navel of the world. But how did it become so sacred to Apollo, the god of prophecy? How did it become the hippest place where one could learn the truth of their future, what they should do, how they should live? One of the earliest stories of the god Apollo is the one that links him not only to the region, to Mount Parnassus, but to the founding of the complex of Delphi itself. It said there was a monster, born of Gaia, called Python. Yes, it was snake-like, if not just an enormous monstrous snake. Some even say the monster was there specifically to guard the oracle, or whatever of it existed then. Some say other gods or goddesses performed the oracular prophecies back then, but those tend to be later sources. Regardless of the source, Apollo hunted Python on Mount Parnassus and eventually killed the monster with his bow and arrow. Possibly near the Castalian Spring, a spring of fresh water that flowed out from the mountainside, as if determined by the gods themselves. It's from this killing of the monstrous python that Apollo took the name Pythian Apollo. It's where the Pythia, the woman who held the oracular powers at any given time, got her title. It's where the Pythian Games, the athletic games held at Delphi, got their name. Python is also sometimes linked with the monstrous creature Typhius, or Typhon, in the earlier mythologies. It may have always meant to be just this one horrible snaky monster, or multiple. 
Either way, it all happened there on Mount Parnassus, and it's where the oracular everything comes from. Oh, Apollo. Apollo is, of course, the god of prophecy, which is where he and his actions there on Mount Parnassus link everything together. He's the god to whom most of the oracles are dedicated, though not the only god. Zeus had one too, along with others. It was believed the gods spoke through the oracles. Delphi wasn't Apollo's only oracle either, just the most famous, the most important, and the most widely referred to both in mythology and history. The key to the oracle, and what makes it so, so fascinating, is that it didn't exist only in the mythology. Yes, Laius was told by the oracle to kill his son Oedipus before the baby could grow up and kill him. Yes, Aegeus was told about loosening wineskins and the like by the oracle. These are timeless stories, and typically include the oracular prophecies really fucking shit up. But in truth, the ancient Greeks really did go to her for their problems, and in reality, she was much less ruinous. There are countless examples of historians and other writers from ancient Greece recounting oracular pronouncements and how the kings, politicians, or whoever acted or didn't act on those prophecies. It was an incredibly important aspect of the ancient Greek world for a time and vital to their understanding of how to handle important decisions. By the time the complex and the oracle herself stopped being regularly used, it was a massive site, not only with the Temple of Apollo, where the Delphic Oracle made her prophecies, but also a theater, a stadium, a hippodrome where horses would race, and storehouses where all the regions would leave their dedications to the oracle. It was enormous, and it had everything. They haven't even unearthed all of it from the mountain. There is still more to find. But it also wasn't the only complex built there on the side of Mount Parnassus. Further down the mountain, there was an even older site, dedicated to the goddess Athena, and possibly much, much older than the Oracle of Delphi complex. It may have once been dedicated to Gaia herself, making it very ancient. From before the Olympian gods took over the Greek religion, when they worshipped women, goddesses above all, before everything went to shit. There, at the older complex of the oracle, is the Tholos, a perfectly round temple that is unbelievably cool? Google it. While it was older, it was still in use during the height of the oracle's reign over the minds of the ancient Greeks. So when you would venture to the oracle making that hike up Mount Parnassus loaded down with whatever you were bringing to offer to her to convince her she should hear you plead your case you would first reach the sanctuary of Athena Pronaya as a sort of welcome, a marker that you were on the right track. But soon enough, another half mile up the mountain, you would finally reach that much sought after complex of the Oracle. But what about this woman I've mentioned so many times but said ultimately very little about? The Pythia. The Pythia is hard to track down. I'll absolutely be revisiting the Oracle more and more as I find more sources, but they're scarce. She was certainly a woman. Perhaps for a time, she was always a young woman, a girl even, and later, maybe, older women were chosen. Regardless, the Pythia was always a woman who, it was believed, the god Apollo spoke through. She was the vessel. According to some things I've found, it suggested that she didn't really hold much of the power, that it was the priest there who interpreted her, that controlled the real results of the prophecy, that in the frenzied state in which she foretold her prophecies, she was indecipherable, and therefore it was the men who deciphered her. Or still, according to others, she was quite clear in her pronouncements, and it was indeed the woman calling the shots, or the god Apollo threw that woman. But I mean, come on. 
The Pythia, however she was chosen, would serve as the voice of Apollo. She would get her prophetic pronouncements only on the seventh day of every month, this being Apollo's day. People would travel from all over Greece to seek answers from her. Though I imagine that at the height of her reign as Oracle, it would only be very rich and very important people who could get in. You had to give quite a bit to the god Apollo in order to receive access to the Oracle. Not to be too progressive, even though it was a woman speaking for the god, she was the only woman permitted within the Temple of Apollo. Everyone else had to be a man. The priests who served her and translated her were men. The people who sought guidance were men. Just one lonely woman making all the rules, deciding the fates of everyone. When she spoke for the god, she would fall into a frenzied state. And there are lots of different theories of what this could have been. Some say a, quote, mystic pneuma came from below. Essentially a kind of breath of the god. So was that the supposed noxious gases from the earth? Apparently there's been no evidence of this found at the site. Or was there something in the water? There's a theory that there was some kind of natural hallucinogen found in the waters of the area, maybe even the Castalian Spring. Or did she eat something that would put her in a hallucinogenic state? There's little written evidence of how and why the Pythia did what she did, It was the god, of course, so I don't think many people felt the need to dig into it in ancient times. She was simply speaking the will of the god. Of course, now, the Pythia is just an incredible mystery waiting to be solved. (music) Meanwhile, in the mythology, Also living and loving in the region of Mount Parnassus and that Castalian spring were the Muses. As you heard in the portion of Hesiod's Theogony that began this episode, the Muses were born of Zeus and Mnemosyne, the titan goddess of memory. That they were born of memory is telling of how the ancient Greeks understood the arts. It's a beautiful concept that all of the arts and music within a person come from memory from essentially within the inner self of the person performing them. But who were the muses? Calliope is the muse of epic poetry, Cleo the muse of history, Thalia of comedy, and Melpomene of tragedy. Polyhymnia is the muse of religious hymns, Euterpe of lyric poetry, Terpsichore of choral song and dance. Erato is the muse of erotic poetry, and Urania is the muse of astronomy. Generally, the muses are understood to be nine in number. This list is one of the most widely recognized when it comes to the standard nine, but the number of muses, their names, and what they reigned over varies quite a bit. It varied by region, with some finding importance in different types of art than others. Across the whole of the mythology, there are a great many different muses for different concepts. The numbers of them also varies quite a bit. The overarching idea of these goddesses who watched over and inspired arts was widely accepted. So much of mythology of ancient Greece has those regional variations. It's always really important to remember that as much as we refer to it now as one place, ancient Greece, it was not a unified region. They didn't have a unified mythology or government or anything. They didn't have the word Greece. There were so, so many city-states that each believed their own concepts and in their own gods and stories. Of course, certain aspects of the mythology were spread more widely, and many of the gods were worshipped throughout the region, but that's because of how much they would interact with each other and an overarching understanding of the Hellenic world and how the stories spread. For today, though, we're going to go with the nine muses, those nine women who inspired it all. The muses were known for their songs. All of them were, whether or not they were devoted to something song specific, were known for their singing and their songs. They were the performers, along with Apollo and his lyre, at so many events and feasts of the gods. They sang for Zeus most often, as he feasted. He was a big fan of those daughters of his. I want to imagine it was in a proud dad kind of way, but he's Zeus, so who the fuck knows. 
Those nine muses with all their skills and inspiration sang to gods very, very often, but it was more rare that the muses performed in the presence of mortals. The muses attended two mortal weddings, and only two. Both were men marrying a woman who was divine in some way, which is why the muses and other gods were in attendance. These were very, very rare cases, and both have stories to accompany them. First, we all know of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis, and what happened there. I won't tell you again about Eris and the apple and those three goddesses who vied for it, but know that because Peleus was lucky enough to be marrying Thetis, that beautiful sea nymph, the muses were in attendance at their wedding, and sang and performed for the couple. And there's more on that story in the origin of the Trojan War episodes. <sighs> Eris. But the second instance of the muses singing at a mortal wedding... Oh, this one is my story. The story is in my blood at this point. Cadmus and Harmonia. At the wedding of Cadmus and Harmonia, all the muses sang. Now, yes, is that basically the only part of the story we know that the muses did indeed sing there? Yes, but regardless, I love it. Hephaestus did also gift Harmonia with a necklace at the wedding, which may have ultimately been the source of the curse on their descendants, but that has nothing to do with the muses, and really only serves to be a downer, so I won't go into it. The point is, all the muses sang. The muses may have only sang to mortals twice, but mortals sang to the muses every chance they got. Homer sang to them. Wrath. Sing, goddess, of the ruinous wrath of Peleus' son, Achilles. Tell me now, you muses, who have your homes on Mount Olympus. Tell me about a complicated man, muse. Tell me how he wandered and was lost. And the poet of the Homeric hymns sings to them. Sing, clear-voiced muse. O oh, Muse Calliope, daughter of Zeus, begin to sing of glowing Helios. Sweet-voiced Muses, daughters of Zeus, well-skilled in song, tell of the long-winged moon. And the poet Pindar sang to them. For me the Muse and her might is forging yet the strongest arrow. And the muse surely stood beside me, unveiling new and sparkling paths of music. This draught of flowing nectar, the muse's gift, the sweet fruit of the mind. Now may invention grant my tongue, riding the muse's car, fit words to tell my tale. O oh, glorious lyre, joint treasure of Apollon, and the muse's violet trest. But the wise daughters of the muses bring to their healing balm the soft embrace of song. The chariot of the golden-crested muses comes bringing inspiration to poets. And everyone's favorite, our girl Sappho, sang to the muses. Glorious gifts of the muses. Fair gifts of the deep-bosomed muses. Hither again, muses, leaving the golden house of your father Zeus. For it is not right that there should be lamentation in the house of those who serve the muses. And even the oh-so-funny Aristophanes sang to the muses in the frogs. O oh, muses, the daughters divine of Zeus, the immaculate nine, who gaze from your mansion serene on intellect subtle and keen, when down to the tournament lists, in bright polished wit they descend, with wrestling and turning and twists in the battle of words to contend. O oh, come and behold what the two antagonist poets can do, whose mouths are the swiftest to teach grand language and filings of speech, for now of their wits is the sternest encounter commencing in earnest." So many of you have asked about the muses in the past. They don't really have stories. That's the answer for so many characters in Greek mythology. We want them to have stories. We feel like they should have stories. But either they didn't ever or we don't have them. The answer to so many things is we don't have it. Whether it wasn't written down enough times to be copied all the way through the thousands of years, or whether it was just sang to one another and never written down. Either way, we don't have it. We are missing 
so much. It makes my heart ache to think about how much we are missing that the ancient Greeks had and that they did write down, but that just hasn't gotten down to us. The muses were vital and their songs were beautiful and they echoed throughout the ancient Greek world. Oh, nerds, thank you all for listening to this, the official 100th episode. This is an extra thrill for me because I've actually been to Mount Parnassus. So often I haven't remotely been to any of the places I have to talk about, but oh, have I been to Delphi. And oh, does it seem like a place worthy of an oracle and singing muses. Just a note, these quotes I read are, for the most part, found and sourced on the website theoi.com, one of the greatest blessings in my life. If they're not on the Muses page of Theoi, then the source is listed in the description of this episode. It's only the Homer that I went with other sources. Now, as to the Oracle, I really do hope to continue on with more in-depth Oracle episodes, mostly on the fascinating historical side. Doing the show full-time has, so far, only resulted in more exciting things coming up and then taking up all my free time, um, but one day I'll figure out how to handle it all. In the meantime, if you ever know of any wonderful sources about the Oracle, God, please send them over. The fact that I even get to say that about my full-time job, though, truly is the most exciting thing ever. So again, on that note, and on this hundredth episode, holy shit, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for whatever support you provide this show, even if it's just listening to it and not complaining about the ads. That alone is huge and the best thing ever. I know it's a transition if you're suddenly hearing more of them, but the difference between what I have now versus what I had earlier when it comes to ads is Frankly, the difference between maybe paying like a quarter of my rent one out of six months to paying my rent. So know that every time you don't get bothered by it, you are saving me and keeping this podcast going. Thank you all for rolling with it and just overall being awesome, incredible, supportive listeners. The fact that I'm at episode 100, but really nearing 200 episodes of the show, is just about the coolest thing in the world, let alone the fact that it's now my job to rant and rave to you about Greek mythology. What a fucking world. And I couldn't do it without you all. So thank you all so very much. Sing muses about just how much I love this shit. (laughs) 